Whoa! There we are. How you doing, folks? Good to see you. Right, so today we're going to just take a bit of a tour through basic rendering. Um, thanks, Pond Pimp. Audio, video, okay. Good to know. Uh, yeah, we're going to... Hey, Darius. Um, we looked at Keppel the other week in a kind of high level, here's what it has kind of view. And this time we're going to do some stuff with it and talk a bit more about the kind of GL pipeline in general. Um, so yeah, let me look at my plan. See what I'm meant to be doing. Okay, so yeah, of course, prerequisites. I am going to assume uh, basic knowledge of like basic linear algebra stuff. Like you know what vectors and matrices are. You might not know all the ins and outs of them. I probably don't either. Um, if you don't, some of this is going to be pretty confusing. And then, but when you go and look it up, there's a few things. Oh yeah, I'm really good at this streaming business. I'm back on the hitting pause to uh, to switch screen again problem. Okay, let's do this. And maybe we can have a thing for doing doodles. All right, there we are. <laughs> you have a plan, how professional. Yeah, exactly, and straight after you say that, I just disable the stream for a second. Cool, right, so a couple of tips if you're gonna be uh, learning more about uh, vectors and matrices, just two little things to keep in your head that might make it a little easier. Um, vectors are, like, we, we draw them as arrows a lot of the time. What they really are is just a pure direction with a magnitude. So they have a direction, the magnitude bit means length, essentially. But vectors have no position. There is nothing about position about them. So even if you draw one here and say one over here, right, if they have the same x and y component, say if this guy over here, then they are the same vector. It doesn't matter where they are, where you draw them on the page. Um, yeah, they're all the same, which is kind of cool. Um, and it makes sense because we don't have that ability to say where the center of like the universe is. We don't measure from one place. Everything is relative. So if I'm staring at you, the camera is kind of like dead out the front of my nose, so dead forward. But if I'm facing this way, then it's a different angle to me. So where you're choosing the origin to be, um, that's how you measure positions, as a difference from a point, agreed upon point, and somewhere else. So when you use vectors for positions, which you'll be doing a lot, and we're gonna be doing today, um, there's always some kind of concept of an origin that's agreed upon for this set of vectors. Um, not always stored with a vector, kind of just be, could just be, uh, yeah, kind of implicit. Anyway, that's vectors. When it comes to matrices, these things look weird, and you'll see them, Here's a matrix. I don't know why I'm drawing it, but we will, right? And it's tempting after dealing with vectors and things to try and find an analogy to matrices in nature. Don't do that. Like, uh, like with vectors, you can kind of imagine, oh, here's a position, here's another position. This is the difference going this way and the difference going that way. That's direction and length, right? But matrices are just a handy tool that people have made up. There isn't a kind of analog per se in nature. This is just like, hey, if we write down some numbers in a grid like this, and then we have some more numbers in a different grid, like we'll define how addition works together and how multiplication works, and they mean something. Yeah, Shimera's saying matrices form a linear basis. Yeah, um, but then you have, yeah. I, I kind of don't want to get into, the, yeah, exactly, some of them anyway. Like you, we start getting into linear algebra, details and one of the things that tripped me up was just trying to find yeah what was this thing it's a handy tool it's a little table of numbers and when you multiply them or add them according to some rules it means something or it does something and it's super handy but yeah don't get hung up on it that's all i'm going to say about those two for now and we're going to kind of just dive in we are going to be looking at essentially the GL pipeline, and it's the same for Keppel, so I'm just going to be talking using Keppel terminology. Hey, young leaders here. Hey, up. Um, Shimera says, I tend to think of matrices as just convenient ways of expressing calculation. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's an expression. It's a, it's a way of writing some stuff down, and it is super useful, and you do get to a point where like, you see meaning in specific ones, and you're like, oh, that's what that is. But at the beginning, you don't have to worry about that. It's tool, it's your hammer, use it. Right, I really will stop on that. Pipeline. 
we're going to be doing rendering. We're going to be getting the GPU to do work for us. And in one end, we're going to feed a stream of data. This is going to be called vertices. We're going to stream these things in one end. And then there's this big pipeline of transformations that's going to happen to your data. And out the other end is going to come, well, pixels generally to our screen, but also we can be writing into GPU arrays in an FBO. So it's essentially data in one end, data in, coming out the other with a bunch of transformations going on in the middle. And so we're just going to start way up the top. So we are going to define some vertices. And I'm going to simplify things for now, saying your vertices are always going to have a position and possibly some other data. Like this bit's optional. You can have as much or as little as you like, but we're going to store all these, uh, these vertices in GPU arrays we're going to make streams which look into our GPU arrays, just like we saw in the Keppel stream the other week. And then we're going to map this over our pipeline. So our vertices come in, and the first place they're going to end up that we need to worry about is the vertex shader, or the vertex stage. Right? And this is part of the pipeline that's actually programmable. You're allowed to stick your own code in there, which makes it special. And the vertex stage is allowed to do anything it wants to the vertices. So the vertex stage is gonna, the vertex shader is gonna get called once for every single vertex that's coming in. And it's allowed to change the position, it's allowed to change the data, add data, remove data, and it's gonna pass its data on and that's gonna travel, carry on traveling down the pipeline. Now when it comes out of here, the positions are going to be well the, the data in general is going to be in something called clip space. And we're going to go into what that means fairly soon. Also, when we start drawing, we don't only specify um, our vertices. We also specify something like the primitive. There's a few bits of data we can pass along. Let's see if I can write today. Doesn't look like it. Primitive. And this is going to be, this is going to tell the GPU, hey, those vertices that you're feeding in, what are you going to turn them into? What, what are we actually drawing? And the kind of things we can draw, stuff like points, lines, triangles, of course. We used to have quads, but we don't have them anymore. And I might go into a second why we don't. So let's cross that one out. Uh, we can also specify patches. And patches um, only really important um, when we're talking about uh, tessellation and things like this, when we're, we're talking about, a, yeah, it, it's saying a, a number of vertices. Basically, patches are going to get turned into triangles later on, so we really don't have to worry about these yet either. Also, points and lines, the way GL has specified how points and lines will be drawn is a bit a bit loose in some areas and a bit annoying in others. And basically the different GPU vendors don't implement it the same way. So if you draw GL points and GL lines, they're gonna look different on different machines, which is obviously makes them useless for games or anything where visual fidelity matters at all. So most of the time when you bring in points and lines um, into, into the pipeline, you're gonna transform them into something else later, normally in like the geometry stage or something like this. So Points and lines, we're probably not going to be drawing those either. It's really all about this guy. It's going to be all about triangles most of the time. Oh yeah, quads. Why do we get rid of quads? Well, when we're drawing stuff, most of the time, we're going to want to not draw the insides of objects. If you've done any kind of game dev before and we have like some object, we don't want to draw the inside of this. We're just going to draw the outside. And so for that, it needs to know when it draws those triangles, which ones are facing out, which ones are facing in, so which direction things are facing. And that's super easy with a triangle because the whole face can only, fa can only face one direction. It can be pointing this way or it can be pointing that way. But if you have a quad, it's actually a little more complicated because if you took these guys and rotated them like this, you would end up with shape kind of like a bow tie, like this. Right? And now this face could be facing forward and the other face will be facing backwards, like, which just makes the maths around it more complicated. And if it's more complicated, 
it's harder to like there's gonna be more ifs things are gonna be slower there's more things to take into account more work to do means stuff goes slower so if we just do triangles life's much easier so when we see quads in games it's always going to be a couple of triangles that's just and gel doesn't even allow you to draw with quads anymore unless you're in compatibility mode so it's moot so yeah we're going to be dealing with triangles i'm actually going to get rid of this now i'll leave it for now but we'll need to get rid of it in a minute the data that's coming out of the vertex stage is going to mean something called clip space now um yeah let's actually have a doodle of that now right so if we have Let's draw this space. So it has some bounds. And this is where your points can be in and they be drawn. If they're outside of this range, they're not gonna get drawn. Let's have a couple of chats going on here. Uh, well, GL could define to do an automatic tessellation, uh, which can be done at upload time. Yeah, which would make the cost minimal. But again, that's extra logic that the driver vendors would have to implement and maintain and it's kind of like for for what's really a minimal benefit in the end um if if it gets to the point where your problem in keppel is um dealing with quads then i have failed at making libraries um so here's our space anything inside here any points that we do inside this range are going to get drawn and once outside it aren't they're going to get clipped or discarded and we're going to get to clipping soon as you can imagine, it's to do with clip space. Now, so we have a point and it has four coordinates in clip space. We have X, Y, Z, and W. And W's a weird one, right? What W says is how big clip space is. So it means that this corner here is minus W, minus W, whoops, minus W, that's the minimum position your point can be in and the largest one is w w w given that every vertex that we're putting in every position that we're putting in can have its own w value that means every single vertex has its own clip space now i know already this is like i'm, I'm sure there's some of you the first time i saw it i was just like what this is so unnecessary and we're going to see why it's useful but Clip space, if it's weird to you, just let it wash over you because you don't need to understand it now. In fact, even doing 3D stuff, you don't have to understand it immediately. And by the time you need it, it'll kind of come more naturally. But um, yes, this is clip space. Its size is defined, defined by W. Every point can have its own clip space. It's kind of difficult to work with everything in a different space. So the next step that's going to be done is that everything is going to get normalized. Now let's see what's the best way of doing this. We'll just say normalize. What actually happens is to normalize it, everything, every position, all of this gets divided by the W, which means the W afterwards, if you divide any number by itself, it's going to be one. So they're all going to end up with one and these are all going to be divided. So it'll be X divided by W, and y divided by w, my writing's worse than usual. And z divided by w. They're all gonna be fit into a box that is, I won't rub that out yet, actually, because that could be useful, is one, 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 two, minus one, minus one, minus one. All right, so all of the points are gonna be squeezed down by their w value, and we're actually gonna see this happen soon. So again, let it wash over you, and we'll get to it very soon normalized and in this new space they are called normalized device coordinates and this is now into so we are now in hmm how should we how should we say this we are in i'm putting my arrows and the names in kind of weird positions so they're normalized and then we're in let's just say let's just write it out here ndc space normalized device coordinate space all it means is our box goes from minus one to one in all dimensions. And all our points are going to be inside there. Now what's kind of handy, because everything's in a one by one by one box, getting rid of things that are outside that box is really easy, really cheap. We just say if it's greater than one or if it's less than minus one, throw it away. And this is where clipping happens. So this is where a couple of things are going to happen, actually. The first thing is all of our points that we defined 
are going to get turned into primitives. So based on what we've said, they're going to get turned into primitives. This is called primitive assembly. And some of our primitives, see if I can find a place to draw that, like this one, are going to stick partially outside of our clipping box. And at this point, GL is going to get rid of this bit and make sure that this is a proper triangle. So in this case, it would just draw a line here and add it up. But it might have to turn one triangle into a couple of triangles, depending on how you slice things. Um, so this is clipping. And now everything is inside this box. And so, yep, we've gone through clipping. And then um, our screens aren't cubes. So we're going to have to um, take into account the size of the screen or the window that we're rendering into. So there's going to be another transformation to our points. And I'm going to need some space now. Let's get rid of this stuff up here. Da, 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 da. And this is going to look at our viewport. If you remember from the other week in Keppel where we defined viewport objects and we rendered into them, that's what's happening here. The viewport gives information, information to the GPU. And again, everything's still in 3D coordinates, but now this has a width and a height and a depth, which is our Z. Good Lord. <laughs> Not even close. You see why I use computers rather than drawing anything. We need some points. And so this is going to go from 0, 0, 0 to width, height, 1. So the depth goes from 0 to 1. It's width and height. Now we're in this range. And so we're going to have all of our shapes still. Let's draw in our two little triangles. This one and this one that was a little further back. Oops. But they're now been squeezed inside this range. Next step we're going to do after all this, this is the... They call this the window. I think it's the window transformation. Like, oh yeah, hot top tip. Don't listen to what beardy people on the internet tell you. Do go and research to make sure they're not full of shit. Because I'm doing this very much off the kind of the top of my head. They have a... Um, they transform into window space. So it's kind of window transform. But it's more accurately um, transport, transform. More accurately, it's the viewport that defines this transformation. So this is really a viewport transformation, we're in viewport space. Next bit is at the moment, we're still working with points and primitives. These are all kind of vector almost based kind of things. These are not, very much not pixels. And our screen obviously is a flat grid of pixels. Even the ones you strap to your face and tell yourself are 3D and VR are just two screens that you've nailed to your head. So we're going to have to turn these into something closer to pixels. And this is called the rasterization stage. And what happens is we split everything into what are called fragments. And the ones with a nice memory of you from the other weeks will remember the fragment stage. And this is the, another bit of the pipeline where we have control. Wow. Dearie me. I either need less or more coffee, I'm not sure which. Fragment stage. And in this stage, again, we have control. We write a little program that is allowed to transform the fragment. Now, we're not allowed to move the fragment because it's like a pixel. Not allowed to move it anywhere, but you're allowed to compute its final color. And we're gonna do loads of stuff in there. Now, it's called a fragment and not a pixel because Pixels are fundamentally 2D, and our fragment still has depth. And if we've actually drawn multiple triangles on top of each other, here's a triangle, and here's another triangle. And let's pretend that that was vaguely in front. Oh, good lord. Here we go. There it is. All right, the yellow triangle is definitely behind the blue one. All right. If we draw two triangles, we're actually going to get a fragment for both of them at the same X and Y coordinates, but at a different depth, a different Z. And just in case you didn't notice, with all of these, you'll notice that X goes this way, Y goes this way, 
and Z goes into the screen. And it might seem really obvious that Z would go that way, but in a minute, well, in about half an hour, we're going to see a case where it doesn't. And that's really annoying, and it's to do with legacy and rubbish. But when we're dealing with clip space and everything onwards, Z goes into the screen, minus Z is toward you. So we've got things um, into our fragments now. This is where the GPU is going to work out what bits to color in, which pixels, or which, yeah, which pixels it's going to have to color in for your triangle. So we're going to have to color in this one. Maybe we color in this one. It's a really bad algorithm. And we're going to end up with a triangle on the screen. But there's that other case I talked about, right? We've got fragments that are behind each other. Fragments of different depths. We have to decide which ones to draw. And so there's a test function that gets run, and you get to pick what that test function is out of a handful of them that are provided to say which one wins. And normally we do less than, so the one that's less far away is the one that gets drawn, which makes sense, right? Like the, the nearest thing to us gets drawn. I'm going to go into a little more detail on fragments a little bit later, but this is the general pipeline. We're going to take vertices, which is we're going to say is a position and some data. We're going to feed it in to the verdict stage, which is a program that's allowed to push all that around. Um, what comes out of the vertex stage has to be in clip space, which means that the last one, that W component of the vector, is going to specify how big the world is that it's in. And all the vectors can be in different little worlds, in different spaces. So then we have to bring them all into the same space, which is normalizing. And then they're in a, a box that it goes from minus one, minus one, minus one to one, one, one. And then the GPU is going to assemble the primitives. Say if you said triangles, it's going to make those points into triangles. If it's lines, you can turn them into lines um, and so on. And then it's going to clip them. It's going to chop all of the things away that are outside the box, throw them away. And then we're going to get the transform that actually turns it into the kind of window coordinates, the viewport coordinates that we specified. Then we're going to turn things into fragments which are like pixels with depth and extra information because we've passed information down this pipeline so it still saves with the fragment. And then after the fragment stage, we've computed the final color and a color is just a vector, okay? So it, like we're gonna make a vector for, for, every, um, for every fragment. And that vector four, you could think of it as RGB and alpha, or because we're writing into FBOs, they could just be vectors. They could just be floats. They could just be numbers. So don't limit yourself to just making colors with your shaders. You can use it for general computation. Now, of course, we have compute shaders and other things as well, like CUDA and all that kind of stuff, which can do compute much better. But you will be doing some computation with shaders at various points. And it's really cool. So it helps to think about this is a thing for transforming data. But most of the time, we're going to be spitting colors out the end of this and putting them on our screen. All right, with that general flow out of the way, what were the other thing? I was one more thing I was going to mention, and it was, I think it was to do with, ah, yes, with fragments. Let me make some space. If we specified a triangle, let's just, let's draw the lines first so I don't actually have to hit a target. And if you remember from the other week, the order that we specify the points dictates what side's the front, what side's the back. So this we, we say this point, then this point, then this point, then it's anti-clockwise, and by default, this face is gonna be visible, showing it to us. If it was the other way around, then it'd be facing away. But when we rasterize, let's get this guy out of the way, and remove these numbers even. Say we've assigned some data to this, maybe a color. So we said this one's red, and this one's blue, We've done this with numbers, of course. And this one's green. And then they're just attached to the vertices. Then we're going to chop this up into fragments. And there's going to be, obviously, a lot more fragments than there were vertices. I'll finish off doodling. So what are we going to do for all these points in between? This one's red and this one's blue, but what is, what's this going to be? So what the GPU does, by default, is interpolate these values. So what you're gonna get is something between red and blue and green. All these values are gonna be smeared, interpolated across the shape, across the primitive. 
and we're going to see this very soon but this is very useful um, because if this triangle let's say that the triangle was 500 pixels high and 500 pixels wide that's what Yeah, 500 by 500, that's what, 25,000 pixels divided by two because it's a triangle. So you're in the 12 and a half thousand pixel range. Is that even right? It might, might be more than that. Could be 150,000. Anyway, you got a lot of pixels compared to your three points that you put in. So this interpolation is what fills in all the gaps. That's super important. Right, we've muffled our way through that. Let's get to some code because it's always more comfortable with code. And we are going to draw a cube and we're going to see all of these things come into play. So we're going to need a project. So I'm just going to go and set my, the directory I'm in. So code lisp. And then we're going to quick load uh, the quick project library, which is a nice way of making projects. Quick project make projects. And let's just split play with that's all right let's go find that project play with verts and we can see that we've got a few files here so we're going to need some libraries to use so we're going to say depends on and we are going to need Keppel and we're going to and we'll use uh, the Keppel SDL2 host so it'll be backed by SDL2. And then we will need, let's have Nineveh because it's just got a load of handy stuff. Um, we're gonna need Vario, but that's gonna be pulled in by Keppel so we don't need to say that explicitly. I have RTG math, but that's also pulled in by Keppel, so that's fine. Is there anything else I want? Don't think so, let's go with that. We can always add some more in a minute. Play with verts. Give it a second to load. Chimera's on a roll. Uh, a lot of GUI toolkits have X, Y, zero in the top left corner, growing left, growing down, because of how monitors render. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, that, that, that coordinate stuff is confusing. And in the end, you can transform between them, so it doesn't matter so much. But we're going to say, you know, in GL, bottom left, up, cross, in. We'll deal with that. In package, play with words. And we're going to need some things in here. So we are going to be using Keppel. We're going to be using RTG math. We're going to be using Nineveh. Oops. And we're naturally going to want to write shaders. So we are going to use Vari. And that's a good place for us to start, I think. And let's kick off Keppel. So we've got a window to render into. Lovely. <laughs> Whoa, an entire cube! Yes, a whole one. Well, just the outsides of one anyway. What's next? Two cubes, a pentagon. Maybe, maybe. Um, well, yeah, it, it's bottom middle. When Chimera's saying Jello isn't even bottom left, it's bottom middle. I, I, Except in window space. What absolute madman came up with the math list? I know. Well, it, it does actually. That there is a degree of sense to all of this, and most of the time, once you've set everything up, this isn't going to be how you're thinking about things all the time. You're going to be thinking about things in your world, and we're going to get to world space. Ah. Drink the various colors and everything will be fine. Right. Let's set up the basics. We are going to need a stream to map over. So let's just make a buff stream. Really can't type. A function to initialize some stuff. And there are some helper functions in Nineveh, which we're going to use because writing out all the data for a cube is the most boring thing in the world. So we're just going to do that. So we're going to say destructuring bind. And this function we're going to call returns some vertices as a GPU array and the indices as a GPU array. And so now we call Nineveh. 
dot mesh primitives, and we're going to have a cube, uh, GPU arrays, and the size is one. It's going to have normal and hex chords. That's fine. And yeah, that'll be fine. And then we're going to make a buffer stream like we normally do in Keppel with our verts, and we say the index array is the index, and that's plenty enough. And then we're going to set f the buff stream to be that. And man, it's weird working on this low resolution. Things I do for you people. And unless we haven't already got a buff stream because we don't need to create it many times. It's called init, and now buff stream has our stream. So that's containing our cube data. So if we go and look at the things inside there, we can pull down. Like, let's do that now. Let's just make another variable to hold the uh, GPU array for the vertices because it's kind of handy to have them around. So if we do buffer, buffer stream uh, GPU arrays for that last thing, and then we get the first one from that, and the first one from that, there's our GPU array. And we set up the GPU array to do that. And every time we look at GPU array now, we can see what we have here. And if we call pull on it, just like normal, we can pull data from the GPU back to local. And this is why I didn't want to write this, because this is really boring. But what we have here are, so this is a structure that holds um, three values. So it has a position, a normal, and some texture coordinates. And we're not going to be using the normal and texture coordinates for now, so we're not going to think about those. The main thing we're interested in is the position. And you can see it goes from minus 0.5 up to 0.5, which should fit nicely in our little space that we were talking about. So we're going to need to do some rendering. So the first thing we need to do is define a function that draws stuff. And it is going to, what do we have to do? Well, we have to clear the screen every time. And at the end, we have to swap. Remember before we're doing, we're drawing to a buffer that we can't see, and then we say swap, and it makes that buffer visible over here in our window. And so we're always drawing to something that's hidden and then swapping it so it's visible. So we never see the drawing process, which is good, because otherwise it would look terrible. And then here, we're gonna map over some pipeline that we're gonna define in a second, and we're gonna map the buffer stream over that pipeline. That's what we're gonna want. And it's going to complain that there is no some pipeline. So let's go define that now. Def pipeline, some pipeline. And it's going to have some vert stage. And it's going to have some frag stage. This is going to be our vertex stage and our fragment stage. Um, double buffering to avoid flickering. Um, well, it means it's to avoid seeing things get drawn with that kind of tearing and stuff like this. Um, like, oh, I'm not going to go into details on that. That's annoying. Right. If we look at our GPU array as well, we'll see that the element type is GPNT. So I'm just going to write that one second. Let's go up here and go define ourselves a GPU function to be our stage. So on vert stage, which is going to take a vert, which is a GPNT. We want to know what how this is laid out. We can just jump to definition and we can see it down here. And we can see this is what I was saying before. It's a structure that works on the CPU and on the GPU. It has a position, which is a vector three, a three, di three dimensional uh, vector, a normal, which is three dimensional and a vector two for our texture coordinates, which we're not going to use yet. Uh, oh yeah, and the other thing is that normally when you're accessing a, a struct, You'll have to say GPNT, the struct name, and the slot. So it's to be GPNT position. But when we're in our GPU functions, we can just use this accessor, um, which is called POS. So we're going to come in here, and we're going to get the position out of our vertex. Remember that the vertex stage has to produce a position in clip space. So that's what we're going to do there. We're just going to take the position and pass it on without doing anything to it. And then we'll get to our fragment stage. Some frag stage. Now, the first value that's returned from a vertex stage is taken to be the position of your vertex. And all the other ones get passed on down the pipeline to the next stages. But it seems we're only returning one value 
This will take no arguments. And for now, we're just going to make the result red. So this is RGB. And instead of if you're used to doing RGB with 0 to 255, in OpenGL it's 0 to 1. So 0 being no red and 1 being maximum red. And the same for the other components. And the W component here, we could use for alpha. We could use for something else. And that something else is details. So we're not going to worry about that today. But often it's alpha. We're just going to leave it at 0. That's fine. So now we have some vert stage and some fragment stage, and we're going to go down here and we're going to tell it which um, stage we want to use for each. We have to specify the full signature. And what's this complaining about? Oh yeah, it's been called already before it was defined. Now we have this. Now we have this. Okay. What happens if I say draw? Things go wrong! The primary return value for vertex shaders must be VEC4, instead VEC3 was found. Well that makes perfect sense, right? Because we were told that the value coming out, the position coming out of a vertex stage must be in clip space. I even said it, and yet I didn't remember this. Um, so it has to be a vector 4. So we are going to just put 1 for now. And we'll draw. And a rectangle, the worst cube. Um, and the reason for this is that our viewport, if we go and look at it, our current viewport, is kind of small. It's 320 by 240, which is probably this, well, probably this little chunk here, because my resolution is so low right now. So we need this to be the same as this window, or in Keppel terminology, the surface. So we can get the current surface. Whoops. Not with we get the current surface from the context. Now, I haven't talked about the context yet in terms of Keppel. Basically, a, the GL context is the state of your rendering right now. So this is so it's you imagine it as the state of GL, and Keppel context is the GL context with some extra metadata, which makes some stuff nice. So we just there is a context. We query things from it, and we normally have one of these per thread. So. We've got ourselves a surface out of this, and then we can say the get the surface resolution, which we can see is also 320 by 240. This definitely isn't 320 by 240. And the reason for this, the, the value being wrong, is that at the moment we're, we're just rendering. We haven't told the host SDL or anything like that to go and get input events from the system. So we're moving our mouse around here and clicking on things the program has no idea what's going on. So all we have to do is go down here and say step host. This is going to go and tell whatever whatever host you're using, whether it be SDL or GLOP or GLFW, whichever one exists, or Wayland, to go and give us all the new stuff. And now when we say draw, it's still wrong. But if we look at the surface resolution, we've now got something that's a little more this size. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, and every time we draw, we're just going to set the position. We're going to set off the resolution, yes, of the current viewport to be the same as the current surface resolution. Now if we do draw, okay, now at least it's the right kind of size. So if we imagine our cube again from earlier, doo -doo -doo, the worst cube. And this is clip space, so it's minus w, minus w, minus w, all the way up to w, w, w. Well, we've said that all of our points that are coming out of our vertex stage, the w is 1. So this is minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 down here. And up in this corner, it's going to be, yeah, 1, 1 and minus 1 because we're looking at it face on right now. Entropy add, state of the art, indeed. Um, you can also do, you, instead of vsync, you can also do triple buffering. Yeah, there's a lot of triple buffering going on on Android. It's, hmm, yes, interesting. Um, okay, given this is a cube, it doesn't look very cubey. Um, but it kind of makes sense though, because if if it's 3D object, 
we could be looking at it dead on, unless we're looking at it from slightly on the side, we're only going to see that face. So that's probably what's going on. So all we need to do is move it sideways a bit, and then we'll be able to see the edge of it. So let's do that. Uh, let's get some of these doodles out of the way. Get them. Get your mouse. We are going to go and add something to the position. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit of refactoring. We're just going to make a variable called POS. And then we're going to increment it. We're going to make it change it again by adding a little bit to the side. So we're going to say 0 0.4, 0, 0. And then we're going to provide POS down here. Now when we draw, it's moved over to the side, but we still can't see the edge. Which is a bit pants, a bit confusing. So we're going to have to do a few things. Now, the first thing that springs to mind is the fact that I'm having to make a change and then call draw is rubbish. So let's get live coding moving a bit better. So we're going to define a main loop and Nineveh provides us with a macro which gives us a simple main loop. So we're going to call it play and then on start, every time it starts, it's going to call init and then inside here, we're just going to call draw. Right, that's our main loop. Now we say play start and we can go and change values. Let's go up here and change this to minus 0.4 and everything's reacting. So yes, now we're working properly in Lisp. Things behave instantly. So right. Um, also, it's kind of boring to have to set this ourselves all the time. So let's pass a uniform up. And if you didn't remember from the other week, uniforms. So we have our, our um, data that's flowing through the pipeline, right? So we have a stream and every single item from the stream, every vertex is going to travel through this pipeline getting transformed. A uniform is a value that stays the same for the entire pipeline. So we're going to make a little float called now, and it's going to be the same for every vertex. And if we also define now here, it'll be the same in the vertex and the fragment stage. But we only need it up here. So we're going to define a little function down here, defun called now, and it's going to get the internal real time, which is just a little list function that's going to get you a current time in units. And we're going to pass it in here. Oh yeah, we're going to want to change that to a float, just to be sure. Float. We're going to say this uniform. Now we do this. And now we're passing that number up. So let's position this guy based on that value. And that is going super fast. So let's... Oh, look at that tearing. Uh, let's slow this down a touch. Okay, and uh, maybe a little faster than that. That'll do. Cool. Right, so it's moving side to side and we can't see the edge. So something's clearly up. One thing we can play with just before we get any further is we said before that that value, uh, that W value defined the size of the clip space and then it gets squished down to be the minus one to one cube, right? So that should mean if we change this to be two, the world was two, which means it got squeezed down and now it looks slightly smaller. And if we keep changing this, it actually looks like it's getting further away. Now this is something kind of weird really, isn't it? Because like perspective where things look further away, like look smaller when they're further away is very much an artifact of us having lenses which focus in light from a wide range. So. If as, uh, as we get further away, we see more stuff and then our brain like squeezes it into our, met like our perception kind of space and things that are further away looks all squeezed together. Same with your cameras. You've got that lens that's bringing on the light and focusing it onto that little square CCD at the back, the sensor that's picking up everything. We're compressing all the information in, the stuff that's far away gets squeezed in more. So squeezing things that are further away in more is something we could do with this, All right? So if we set a higher W, it gets shrunk a bit more. So that's kind of like perspective. The brain does nothing, it's just physics. Right on. But there is some stuff going on there. 
I'd say it's not like if you had lasers, like two parallel laser dots for eyes, and you looked at a tree that was roughly that width, you'd be able to feel the width of that tree as, oh yes, right? It's that, it's that size. And if the tree was a mile away, your two laser dots that are perfectly parallel would hit the same position on the tree, regardless how far away the tree is. So then you'd be like, ah, your strange parallel eyes would see objects further away not as being smaller. But, um, but yeah, weird, weird, confuses me. As you can probably tell from my waffle. Anyway, messing with W makes things smaller. So let's make things that are further away have a higher W. And let's just hack this in for a second. So we're going to take our original position, we're going to calculate ourselves a W. For now it's just going to be 1, just to make sure everything works. That did not work. Okay, oh yeah, because I've taken this value out. Let's stick one a W in there and say continue. Now everything's working. And we can go and change this to something else to make things smaller. So let's start by just using the Z from the position. And it's disappeared. And if we go and have a look at our data, Oops, yep, at our GPU array data, we can see why. So we have some um, numbers that are minus 0 0.5 and all the way to 0.5, which means that like if you're at some point we're dividing by zero, things are going everywhere, things that are minus numbers getting divided weirdly. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take the Z and we're gonna add 0 0.6 for now. This is just a hack. So this doesn't, it doesn't mean anything special. It's not something you've got to remember. Um, but what it's going to mean is this Z coordinate suddenly becomes in the range 0.1 to 1.1. So at least now we should have something that's visible. And we can see something. It's a bit strange though. Let's move it a little further away. 1.6. Okay. And now we can see the sides, right? So the things that were further away, we shrunk down a bit. And the things that are nearer, we left how they are. And now we've got this kind of perspective thing going on. So when, the, when I put up the stream, I was saying, what does GL give you out of the box? And the answer is not much. You get, a re you get a cool API for controlling a really cool piece of hardware. But the price of it being at your mercy, that being programmable, is that you have to do a lot of stuff yourself. The good news is you set this up at the beginning of your project and you don't have to fiddle with it too often. Now, doing this kind of picking good values for W is just horrible. Like, we're, we're not going to do this. We don't. This isn't how we want to spend our time. And as Shimera alluded to earlier, we're going to need something to do this transformation for us. And luckily, there is such a thing. So we are going to get a perspective matrix. As I said before, those matrices, um, they represent some kind of transformation. I think I said that before. Maybe I didn't. I'll say it now. They represent some kind of transformation. Um, and this one is going to transform these points in a way that makes sense for perspective. So we need a maths library, but we have one of those. So if we go to RTG math or your favorite maths library, um, and we look in the correct package, projection, perspective, yes. Um, and we can have a look at the definition and we see that it takes some values. It takes a width, a height, a near, a far, and a field of view. The width and height are the viewport size. So it's this up here. And then the near and the far is saying, what's the nearest thing that we can draw, which we're gonna set to something above zero um, because you don't, because there's some dividing going on at some point basically is the short version of all this and you don't wanna divide by zero. Also, when numbers get really small in floating point, like we're dealing with floating point everywhere. Like when numbers get really small in floating point or they get really massive, the precision goes down, so you start getting inaccuracies. So we're going to set the near to be, let's set it to 0.1. And the far plane is the furthest thing away we can see. And we're just going to set it to something like 30 right now. And then the field of view is the angle from here that we can see. So I'm going to set it to 60, and we're going to have ourselves a matrix. So I'm just going to put this down new line so we can mess with it over here. Get rid of this. And I am messing all kinds of things up. Let's take these so it can remind me of what I need to fill in. Okay, so the width and the height we are going to fill in from um, the current viewport. So we're going to get the X of the um, resolution 
of the current viewport. And for the Y, and for the Y, if I don't hit all the wrong keys, that's the height. Our near we're going to say is 0.1, and our far we're going to say is 30, and our field of view is going to be 60. We hit return, we get a matrix, and if we look at the length of that, we'll see it is having a hissy fit because I wrote length, which is how it sounds, but it's not how it's spelled. Length 16. This means this is very likely, and actually is, a 4x4 four four matrix. So, we are going to need to upload this to our GPU. We're going to call it Perspective. It's a MAT4 for matrix 4. Let's go and take this and put it into our drawing function. So, down here, we're going to pass up Perspective. There's our call to make the matrix. Nothing's crashed yet, so we assume everything's okay. And then instead of us fudging around with W, what we're going to do is we're going to make... Well, we're going to multiply the position for a start. This is going to break, but we know, we'll know why in a second. We're going to multiply our position by the perspective matrix, and this is going to transform those positions. And when I compile this, it's going to crash and say that simple W is not defined. That is very true. And then it's going to complain in the way I thought it was going to complain and say that you can't multiply a matrix 4 and a vector 3, which also makes sense. So we are just going to go and make this into a vector 4 again. And now we're going to run into something weird. And Luna, if you hated these, uh, this maths before, you're really going to hate it in a second because, for whatever reason, traditionally, OpenGL cameras, when they were done for you, they had Y going up, they had X going across, so X going right, but in this direction, into the screen, was minus Z, which is backwards from everything else that we've been working in so far, everything that's intuitive, like plus Z is coming towards me, which sucks, right? But it also has become standardized or whatever. So you'll find that all the like the functions that make perspective matrices are going to have the camera facing in the negative Z direction, which means now that our cube is sitting somewhere in the wrong place. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to move it negative Z. So it was between, what was it between? 0.5, not there, negative 0.5 and 0.5. Let's just move it back. Let's just move it back. So let's just add seven, oh no, minus seven here, or minus six. There we go. And here's our little cube. Way. Still a little hard to tell it's a cube, mainly because we've got no shadows. Um, and no color even difference between the two sides, which is kind of annoying. So what we're going to do is we're going to fudge up some colors just to, just to have something there. Um, I've been missing out what's going on in the chat because I've been rambling. Let's have a go. Um, I don't know if the laser analogy is reliable for the rest of us humans. I know, but it's kind of hard to... Th like, how do you describe... What would it be like to have orthographic vision? I would, I, if you've got a good description, anyone, I would, I would love it because it's, I was trying to think of this the other day. Like, how do you describe what it would be like to see things that are further away, the same size as the things that are near you? It's mind screwing. Yeah, GL would give you all of this too. Yeah, but it's all emulated. Like they you're relying on the, the vendors to do this in a in a certain way like I, I actually prefer prefer having the control but maybe i'm just maybe there's a stockholm syndrome setting in that i've just been doing too much of this for too long architectural plans are orthographic true um but it's been a long time since i've looked at any architectural plans i'm not sure i suppose it's been a lot longer since i've had laser parallel laser eye vision so Maybe architectural plans was a better <laughs> analogy than laser eyes. But I like laser eyes. 
more for having control, but it shouldn't be necessary to have to implement all this crap if it's already there. Yeah, I sympathize. Um, I guess, like, if we, like, if, if us especially just shut up and use the game engine, we wouldn't have to worry about any of this because it would already be done. But I like, I like the toys. I like playing around. I want to learn this stuff. But yeah, it is weird. It's weird. So I want to put some colors on this thing. So we're going to set the colors at the vertices in our vertex shader and we're going to see what happens to them. And I need some color data, but what I've got on the GPU at the moment, if we look, we've got some numbers, but they aren't exactly what we want. Now these numbers again, we've got three numbers here, which would be perfect. Um, but some of them are negative. So if we just add 0.5, then all of these numbers will be in the range 0 to 1. And we can use those as colors. So let's just do that for now. We're going to fudge up a little color. Color is going to be the position of the vertex plus 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. There's a better way of writing this, but I'm not going to do it now. And now we're going to return. Whoops. Oh, yes, of course, I've got, um, I've got my editor set up to show me bad white space, but I haven't got it set to automatically fix it. One second. Yeah, that's going to get annoying if I don't deal with this now. It's so code, lisp, let's just copy a settings file from somewhere else. Uh, the works, careful. Let's take the editor config and the git ignore, why not? And the license, sure. And then copy that, and we're going to go down to play with verts, put it in there. Save this. Oh, no! Don't you dare quit Emacs. Right. So now if we do this, it'll get rid of it for me. Okay, right. Little interlude there. I just needed to sort some stuff out so I don't go crazy. So we're calculating our silly color, and we're going to return two values from our vertex shader now. Let's just put this on a new line. Nothing's happened yet because we need to use this value over here. So we're going to have a color, which is a VEC3, because that's what this is, and it's getting passed down. We need to go and tell our pipeline that we're using the fragment stage now that takes a VEC3. And that's compiled. And then we're going to swap out this color for the one we've passed in. And now we can actually see a little bit of difference between the sides. And notice that the color across the cube is smooth. And that's for the interpolation that we were talking about earlier. So um, you can turn this off. If you go in here, okay, this is a, a, a Vario specific thing. In, um, in GLSL, you would normally have to declare the variables, the names of the variables that are coming out of your stage at the top of the file. And you can put on there little qualifiers to tell it how the value is going to get transformed. In Avari, we um, just return multiple values. So all you do is you wrap it in a list and just put a keyword to say how this should be interpolated in this case. But you can put a number of things there. So if we say flat, it's not going to interpolate them. And you can see then that the colors that have been assigned to each corner apply to that whole triangle rather than getting smoothly interpolated across. In fact, it'll be the color from the first corner, the first vertex in the triangle is used for the whole triangle. But that looks horrible and I don't want to deal with it. I want it to look horrible in a different way. So we're going to use smooth, which is also the default, so we don't need to specify it. So then we've got our cube and because we've got our perspective matrix, things look 3D. And now we can move it further away and we can move it closer. We could, uh, yeah, we could do some of that. Let's, uh, let's just make it do something a bit more interesting for a second. Rather than going back and forwards, how about circles? Oh, the future, it's like Far Cry. Um, even Far Cry is really hard. Right, um, Let's have this at a different frequency so we can actually see something. Whoa, okay, that's not how I meant it. Of course, this is now positive. I need to make things negative. Negative. Um, oh, wait a second. I'm doing this in a stupid way. 
add negative 5, and then we're just going to do this. This is getting further away and closer. Let's speed it up a little. Okay. Depth! That's horrible. It's still horrible, but slightly less offensive. All right. So, a lot has already gone on. This has been uh, quite a lot of information to dump on you in one go. Back to the, the uh, <laughs> hardcore, yes. Um, let's have a look at the chat. Right. Isometric games are orthographic too. Ah, yeah, that's actually a good one. Hmm. Yeah, that might work. I might have to, I might have to drop the laser eyes analogy and go for isometric instead. Uh, <laughs> no teapot, no go. Indeed. Um, okay. So we've got the basics set up now, and we can start riffing on this, and we can, and we will. Um, but this is the very basics of this our rendering. But because it was a lot of stuff, let's do a little bit of a recap. Now, one of the important things is that we are having to do an absolute shit ton of work. Like this GPU, I mean, even, I know this, this is the simplest thing, but let's just say you wanted to like actually just color in your entire, if you've got a 1080p screen, that's 8 million pixels or, and some, that you've got to pick a color for every frame, 60 frames a second, and um, it's obviously like we're saying the fragments, there are multiple things at multiple depths. So we've got all the ones at different depths as well. So we have fragments, 8 million this way, that somebody that way. Um, like there's a lot of work to do. And we've got the fact that like we at the moment, we're dealing with how many vertices? Let's just have a look at this again. We're dealing with 24 vertices. It's nothing, right? The characters in the latest Final Fantasy game, they had something like 20,000 vertices for their hair. So we've got to do a lot of stuff. And we're going to, so we're going to have to do it in parallel. And the way we can get uh, things to be parallel is if they don't have to depend on each other. So you'll notice that your vertex stage isn't allowed to look at other vertices. It only is allowed to work on itself and pass the data on. And the fragment stage is only allowed to work on that individual fragment and the things, obviously, it's allowed to look up in uniforms as well, but it isn't allowed to say, hey, what's that fragment doing? And this means because none of them can interfere with each other, everything can be done in parallel, more or less. There are restrictions, but for the vertex shader, as long as it remembers the order, so say we've got our three points again, not you. Let's say we've got our triangle. It doesn't matter if it processes all of these at the same time, as long as it remembers the order so that it can assemble them into primitives later. And this is the big win, um, but it also comes with some costs. And I'm not sure if this is the right stream to start getting into the kind of those kind of details, but there are some implications. Um, your GPU is optimized for, um, yeah, getting things through fast. Your CPU is optimized for really for one um, instruction stream where your GPU is going to be doing many at the same time. That means on the CPU, you've got these big caches and it can do the kind of look aheads and um, what am I thinking of? Uh, yeah, um, branch prediction that the GPU simply cannot do. Um, it's also doing things, if you're used to anything with SIMD, um, then it's the same kind of thing as this. If you've got a hammer, <laughs> with seven heads you can hit seven nails in with one swipe but like everything has to be lined up just right pom de pimp um oh actually there's a few bits going on here <laughs> is a three pot <laughs> what is going on <laughs> entropy ad a li slightly less offensive man i didn't realize it was offensive you mentioned it yeah uh offensive things are fine oh, okay it's just so yeah. Um, <laughs> teapots are a symbol of the British colonial regime, so they're, they're obvious. They're offensive indeed. Truth. That's it. That's how we did it. We did it with tea and flags and dignity. Um, there was no dignity, but there was all kinds of other tea. Uh, right. Yes, so things are happening in parallel. 
And we don't have branch prediction, so ifs can be quite expensive. I'm actually going to skip. I was going to go on a bit of a rant why, but I'm going to skip that for now. We can come back to it later if we want to. I have to consult the plan. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. So we're going to be doing lots of things in parallel. And we're going to... What was the other thing? There was something that was in my brain that I was meant to be talking about. But it's gone. So while I try and remember, feel free to yell some questions at me. The plan! Yeah. Um, nope, it's not coming back. Ah, it's fine. So yes, if you have any questions, shout them out. And... I'm going to carry on anyway, so that's fine. So we defined a load of data. We stuck it in a GPU array. We made a stream which let us look into that GPU array. We mapped it over a pipeline, which was down here. Where are we? Pipeline down here. Wow. Here's our stream. And our pipeline had some stages that were programmable and some bits that we couldn't control. Uh, data went in and the first thing it did, it got transformed by this program where we got to mush it about. And the, the position that left here, the position was this one, right? This had to be in clip space. Um, and that means that the W component specifies how big the space it's in is. And this is like, if, it, if you're doing a 2D game, you don't have to care about it. Just set it to one, everything's fine. Um, but if you're doing 3D stuff, this is how we're gonna get our perspective and things like this. Because everything in the next step is divided by that W and gets it all into the same space into this one two unit by two unit by two unit cube. Everything outside the cube gets chopped off. This is called clipping. And then all that gets thrown away because as you can imagine, we don't want to do anything. Um, but we've got so much to do already. We don't want to have to do anything that we don't have to. And anything that's outside of our screen, we don't have to do. And it's going to get really expensive as it gets down to that fragment stage and gets split into millions of fragments. Right? Then there are other optional stages, which we're not going to talk about today, and I'm going to go out of focus. And then we're going to hit the fragment stage, and all those fragments are going to be processed, and the fragment shader is going to be called once for every single fragment. And then after that, some of those fragments are going to be thrown away based on depth. Depth. Let's talk about depth. That's a good place to go. After, after we've done with all that, of course, these values are going to get written into FBOs and, and the blending parameters are going to tell it what to do if there's values already in the FBOs. So if you're writing some stuff in, there's already some stuff there. How do you combine the two things? We don't have to worry about blending today. Let's talk about depth. And let's also have more drinks and check the chat because we need to do everything at once. Shimera's question was, when are you going to make an actual game? When it excites me more than making Keppel, I like Keppel. It's fun. <laughs> when it stops being fun, fun playing around with the engine stuff. That! It's just so much fun. Right. It's very exhausting to scream. I wish you didn't require that for questions. I will only accept scream questions. Anyone whispering will be banned. Uh, see, I know as I said that, it's like, oh, right, everyone's just going to start whispering now. So fuck you, people. And... While you whisper, I'm going to go and start on depth. So there is a function that defines how... If Actually, if we're going to do depth, we need more objects. So the first thing we're going to go and do is enable instancing. Instancing is a really cheap way to get a lot of the same thing on the screen. Or into whatever. So we say... Um, is it with instancing? Yeah, with instances. That's it. And we say how many? We're going to have 100. 100 a lot. And now, even though we're doing this map once, it's actually doing a hundred times what we've said. So it's when we say map, it's going to map a hundred times. But it's going to do that on the GPU so we don't have to send a hundred instructions. And that communication between the CPU, which is the client, and the GPU, which is your server in this kind of arrangement, is really costly. So any time that you can get... like. The less you have to say, and the more the GP you can do for everything you say, the better your performance is going to be. And there's all kinds of strategies for making that better. But instancing is one of them. Now, we've got 100 cubes here, but they're all on top of each other, so it's very hard to tell. And... <laughs> oh, for, 
fuck's sake, Chimera. Oh, god damn it. Yeah, I knew, I, it, like, there's always one, and it would always be you. Okay, now I have to select, no, actually, maybe I could just make this text bigger. God damn it. I like to do engine stuff, he says. Always complain about the hassles of it, he does. Yes! I'm a grumbly, hairy man. That's literally my job. I can't stay this grumbly and hairy if I drop the grumbling. <laughs> right. Oh, dear. And for those watching this on YouTube, Shamara put that in the tiniest font, or as all in superscript or subscript or something like this. Because he is an ass. But the best kind of ass. Oh, by the way, before I forget, Shamara's doing a stream this weekend on his game engine trial because he... <laughs> Because as much as he bitches about me building engine tech, he's also building stuff. And his approach to shaders in Lisp is actually really interesting. And it's completely different from Keppel's. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, Shamira can put the times and the dates on the stream, on the chat rather. and um, Or you can go to the Lisp subreddit and it's there as well. Depth, we were going to talk about depth. Now I'm on the wrong computer. Don't ban an eighth of your audience. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but it's quality though, isn't it? I'll take my eight real people, probably one who is a bot, over a hundred bots. But I might trade Chimera for bots. No, 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 no. Right, depth, 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 depth. What are we going to do? Oh yes, we were doing instances, weren't we? Yes, there's a hundred cubes and they're all on top of each other. So we need some way to differentiate them. OpenGL gives you a variable on the GPU. <laughs> God damn it. Um, that lets you identify which instance you're in. So let's go and get that. So we have an ID. I'm just gonna call it ID because we, we have limited screen real estate here. And the variable name is GL instance ID. And that's a bit long. So we're just gonna use ID. And then we're gonna add, because all of our positions are based on this variable now, let's just go and modify now. Plus now ID. Right, there we go, lots of cubes. In fact, that's probably too many to actually make this point. A <laughs> hundred is a lot when your screen is tiny. 10, there we go. Groovy. So, I maybe want to slow this down just a touch. And by a touch, I mean five times. As we can see here, things are intersecting. Depth is kind of interesting and kind of tricky because like I said, we need to do things in parallel. Um, and we need to draw a load of triangles. And we need to make sure that the ones that are nearer to us are in front. So the dumbest way of doing this would be say, hey, we're gonna draw all the triangles in order. We're gonna draw them back to front. So we would draw this triangle and we color that one in. Then we draw, the, whoop, that, that's the eraser because I am a professional. Right, and then we're gonna draw this triangle and we're gonna color this one in and because it was drawn later, it's on top, right? And then we can draw this triangle, and it's on top again. This scheme, not only does it suck because every vertex has to wait for all the ones before it and you have to sort everything, it breaks all the time. Here's a trivial but stupid example that's used all the time to how it can break. Let's have this triangle go here, right? This one. And they might be triangles. They really might be. And then we have a triangle on top of it. Going this way. And you can probably see where this is going now already. This one. And then we have a triangle on top of this that goes in front of the green one, but behind the yellow one. Which triangle do we draw first? There is no good solution to this question, which is why drawing triangles in order sucks, apart from everything else. This seems rather contrived, but one of the places you will see it more is in games if you have a wall and then you have, say, some kind of ledge, which are all the rage. Um, some kind of waist-high wall for you to hide behind. And this is two triangles. Then if you're standing here, let's actually put you around here. Here, this triangle is closer than these ones, but this part of the triangle of the same triangle is further away than the wall. So again, we're in a situation where things can be both in front and behind other stuff, which sucks. So this method is not gonna work and it will be dirt slow because we need to sort, we need to order, all these kind of things. No good. So the approach we do 
is that we're going to leave it to the fragments. So, like I said, when we when we are rendering stuff, I'm going to have more doodles because there can never be enough doodles. When we split everything into fragments, they're not just 2D, like we drew with our cube before. They, they have a depth as well. So we can process all of these fragments in parallel and then just keep the ones we want based on some heuristic. And that heuristic is the depth test, as Shamara pointed out already. And to get to it in Kettle, you call the depth test function of the context. Now this is one of these places where the print syntax for Lisp is a little shitty because it puts uh, yeah these, these angle braces at the front and the end so you can't actually see this is the less than function, right? So if I say less than, that's that same function. So we can change this function by setting it and we're going to set it to nil. So now we have no depth test. And if we, we look on the right, we can see what's happening. Watch as the box gets further away. This should be behind this box now, right? It's smaller, they're all the same size cube. So if they're smaller than the other one, they're further away. But it doesn't draw behind it because depth test has been turned off, which just means the last thing that was drawn is the thing you, that's in front. So default, yes, you can't see where I'm pointing. I am. Still a professional. Right, let's do this. Okay. This guy over here, right? These cubes are all the same size. So when this guy is smaller than the other one, it's further away. But because we turn the depth test off, it's drawn on top of the other one because it's drawn later. It's one of the later instances that are drawn. So we need to say, hey, we want to keep the, the fragments with the least depth and that's why we use the less than function as our test and then you can see on a per fragment basis we get depth it's all nice and i will say perfect for a lack of a better word there are better words but uh perfect as we're gonna get for now so there's our depth and the nice thing about this is it's all parallel like we can just do all of our fragments and then afterwards we can do this kind of um throwing away and we can group things and there's all kind of smart stuff your GPU is going to do to make this quick. Oh, good old Pomdepemp has linked Shimera's stream. Uh, <laughs> no promises about quality. Of course it's quality. It's full Shimera quality. It's everything you're getting here and more. Um, okay. Right, so that, that's depth that we need to worry about. So, that is objects, 3D objects in some kind of space moving around. But one of the things obviously we'll always want when we're dealing with these kind of, um, these kind of engines is a camera. And guess what? Cameras aren't provided in GL either. Neither in DirectX, as far as I know. Please feel free to correct me on that kind of stuff. Like, these are tools that you make yourself because there's enough variance between what people want that they don't actually uh, <laughs> they, they don't actually agree. One of them is wanting more doodles. Um, Shimera, actually it's going to be less. I won't show my face and even if I did I wouldn't <laughs> have a beard. Okay. Why do I not? I should read. I shouldn't like. The problem is I just look at I trust you people and I look over and just read what you say. And it's going to be like goddamn scene from Bruce Almighty. Ah, okay. Yeah, Shin, you've got to have doodles. What's the world without doodles? You don't get to say doodles if you don't have doodles, and it's a stupid word. You should say it all the time. Okay. Cameras. Where are we, by the way? We are at 20 past nine. Ah, we've only been, we've only been going for an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I'm up for some more. If you guys are up for some more, I've got plenty of lukewarm coffee and water to keep me going. So if you shout, yes, we will keep this up and we'll look at cameras because it's kind of useful to have a peek at those. And is Luna still there? Because <laughs> I saw there was like, the beginning there was math panic. So I wanted to know who I've scared away during this. Hey, cool. 
People are grabbing another beer. It's a good time to grab a beer. Let's let's do that. I'm actually I'm I'm out of beer. We're out of cake. I want to see who's in the room. There we go. Nice. Uh, what did you have planned? I'm uh, entropy out. I'm just going to do some stuff on cameras. I think like knocking up a simple camera and seeing what that involves because that's not provided in GL. Because then we've got objects and a camera, and we'll have a little. That'll be our. That'll be our little. The most primitive three D engine you can have. Um, yeah, actually, you're going to see slightly better graphics in Chimera's stream than we've had so far. It's, rec it's recommended. I should. I should just like for Chimera messing around in the chat. I can just. I can just big it up to say it's the most amazing stream. Most li best list graphics there has ever been. Ah. It's going to be cool though. Uh, I really I d do recommend for the uh, approach for shaders. It's sweet. And his stream is going to have teapots. Like, what more can you ask? Better. Better than crappy cubes. Right. Cameras. Let's do cameras. So, we know already that. He's done it again! I just can't help myself. I've got to keep... I've got to keep pausing the stream every now and again. Otherwise we won't know what's going on. Right. Maybe that's the last one for the stream. Okay. Switch back to the Linux machine. Better. Better. Now I can start doodling. Right. I... I, I know I should rechange those config buttons, but I'm not going to. Um, it's part of the charm of the stream. Right. We know already that we have to fit everything into... Clip space, whatever we're doing. Because that makes the math nice and fast for clipping. And that's really important. So, even though we're going to pretend that we have a camera somewhere in the world, rather than positioning our camera in the world and rotating it in the world, we're going to rotate the world and bring it to us. So we're going to have our camera, essentially, let's... Da -da -da. At zero 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 and it's gonna be facing in the minus Z direction because ugh because it's the worst API choice in the world except everything that Android does. Um, and we're gonna rotate everything to us. And so then okay so let's say we have some objects da -da -da, and a cube and a triangle. And our camera would normally be like here, looking at them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna rotate everything back to the origin and facing this way. So everything comes down to here. All of these are gonna rotate. So we're gonna end up with, I don't remember what they were already. Let's just say, yeah, in view. And again, everything's relative when it comes to spatial stuff because there is no justified center of the universe. Like, moving forward is the same as the whole universe coming backwards at you. There is no way to tell, so it's all mathematically sound. So we're gonna be fine. And that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna store a position and a rotation for our camera. And then we are going to move everything in the inverse of that. So if the camera is at 1010, 10, we move all the objects minus 1010. 10. Minus 10, minus 10. I'm good at this. Right. Um, just buy another mouse, my dude. Yeah, but then I'm going to grab the wrong mouse all the time and I'm going to get... Look, this is never going to be a smooth experience. So we're just going <laughs> to we're just going to have to accept that I'm going to cock it. I, I'm going to work with what I have and I'm going to cock it up in a variety of interesting ways. Um, <laughs> Chimera, Ponder Pimp says, Chimera, will your bot be there? If my chat doesn't break, which it probably will. Yeah. That's cool. Right. So, we're going to need some data. Let's just start off with a position, because that'll be nice and simple. Let's make a variable for our camera position, and it's going to be at 000. 
Let's actually name this variable properly. Got to give it to muffs. It'll have one cold ear. And then we are going to pass this in with, right, okay. The first way I'm going to do this camera is not how you do a camera normally in game, but we're going to build it up. We're just going to go with the base, like we're going to go with what sounds logical, given that we're going to move the universe to us. And then we're going to build something that's a little more kosher. All right. So let's have a cam possible. Uh, uniform. Oh yeah, that means that we're going to have to add it up here. So, I'll have our perspective and have a camera position, which is VEC3. Let's go down here, compile this, and now our camera position is being passed into our pipeline. And then we're going to take the position that we, like, so we have the objects in a certain position in the world, and then we're going to subtract our camera position. So rather than moving our camera forward, in, a, in like, we're going to subtract the camera position from everything else and bring it to us. So new pos is going to be pos minus cam position. Right? And it's at zero, zero, zero. So currently, no change. So let's get cam pos up here. And now let's set it. Someone's got a motorbike. And they're very proud of it. Right, and remember the camera's point in the negative Z. So if I set one to here, everything's going to look slightly further away. If I pick positive numbers, I'm moving away from stuff because I'm going backwards. But if we use negative numbers, now we're moving towards our objects. So this is us moving our camera forwards. And backwards. Done. Right, now we need a rotation. Now, for the sake of my sanity, I'm not going to, like, we can use a matrix to represent our rotation on the CPU side. I'm going to use a quaternion. Don't, if you haven't heard of what a quaternion is, don't worry about it. It's mathematically weird. Um, but all it is, it represents a rotation. In the same way that a vector only represents a magnitude and a, and a, a, and a direction, a quaternion is a pure representation of, of a rotation. Oh, that was quite interesting to say. It isn't a rotation around something. It isn't a rotation of things in, in a certain position. It's just the rotation part. So let's have our cam rotation. Therefore, cam rotation. And we're going to use the identity quaternion, which means no rotation. It's your basic facing forward quaternion. And then. Right, so if our camera was to look right, it was to rotate right, then in our, like from our perspective, if you, if you turn your chair to the right, it's like the world turned left. And if you turn left, everything kind of went to the right. So we are going to um, have to do the inverse rotation of whatever cam rot says. So cam rotation, we'll invert it and we'll use that. So let's go down here. Let's uh, go up here. We need a cam rotation. Now, the GPU doesn't handle quaternions. There's details to that. This is super arm wavy, right? There isn't a primitive that's provided with GLSL that is a quaternion. You can do quaternion math on the GPU. We're not going to be doing it. It's not one of the standard things. We're going to use a matrix three, which is perfectly adequate for representing a rotation. And is supported out of the box. Oh, this is why I don't. This is why I do these kind of streams, where it's like just, nah, you know, we'll throw some words around, we'll make some mistakes, and get in the right direction. I hate doing the really precise, like nitty gritty. No, you could do quaternions, but we won't. No, we're gonna say we're gonna use a matrix. So where's our cam rotation? Okay. And now we want the inverse, because like we said, if we rotate the camera right, we want everything to go left. So let's get the inverse of this, which is Q quaternion inverse. And then we want this as a rotation matrix, which is a matrix three. So we're going to say two, map three. Bam, nothing happened, which is good, because we haven't done anything with it yet. So now we've got this matrix. And so we're going to transform our position one more time. Oh, no, we're going to do it down here. So this is where we position the object. Let's write some notes here. Position the vertex. 
This is the cam stuff. Camera stuff. I guess there are other kind of cams. Gears. Right, position. We're going to multiply the rotation matrix by our position. And still nothing has changed, which is right, because we've got an identity rotation so far. So right now, nothing should change. We want to rotate the camera now and see if it's had any effect. Now, I'm not going to go into the details why again. Feel free to look it up. It's like with the perspective math, right? If you want to understand why it does that, rather than just it does it, go look it up. And there's some phenomenally thorough mathematical articles about the GLSL projection, all the different matrices for your orthographic and uh, perspective projection ones and they go through it line by line of all the equations and it's wicked and I cannot do a stream like that it's just not how my head wants to be so I want to play with stuff so we got some camera stuff we need to do some rotation yes rotation when we do rotations positive means anti-clockwise there are details as to why it's do if you want to search look for right-handed coordinate systems um, but the result is that when we rotate, a positive number is anti-clockwise, negative number is clockwise. Fine. So we are going to get rid of that screen for a second. We're going to set f the cam rotation to be, and I want to rotate left by like a couple of degrees. Um, so let's make a quaternion. And we're going to do it around an axis angle. So what we're going to do, so an axis angle rotation is you define an axis, so a vector, so they're pointing somewhere, and then we say a number of degrees around that axis. Um, so our axis is just going to be straight up. Zero, one, zero. Positive y. And then we're going to define an amount in radians. And what I'm going to do instead is define it in degrees and use this radians function, which will convert it into radians. So we say two degrees, I make it a float. Um, and that will make two degrees into radians, and that will be two, de two degrees around this axis. So we do that, and everything moved very slightly. And if I just keep on increasing this value, you'll see that we're, ah, oh, this is so tedious. Who wants to watch this? Right, let's do it. Let's, let's make it do it down in the drawer. Just like we set the uh, resolution every frame, let's just set the rotation of the camera to something. Radians, sign, there's always a sign in here somewhere. Sign of now. And let's lay this out a little bit differently. Let's just put it down here. That is going very slowly. So probably, oh yeah, it's the sign. It's only gonna be going one degree. So we need to multiply this a bit. Let's rotate 20 degrees. But that is also very slow. So let's multiply this value by 100. That's quite a bit. So anyway, yes, we have some rotation now. So again, we don't have cameras open GL, but we make our own. And the way we do it is we move everything Move the universe to us. And... <laughs> and Shimera is shaking his head in disapproval of things. <laughs> Shimera is shaking his head in disapproval like the camera. Yes, this is GL being very unhappy with that how it's used. It's like, I was meant for beautiful things. Oh, headbanging. Yeah, that's <laughs> just... <laughs> let's just change the axis. There we go. And now we can up the frequency and it makes sense. So, so there we go, GL headbanging. Um, oh god, that is that is the most distracting thing. God damn. Right, so here's our here's our little camera. The way we're specifying these values all separately is super annoying. So let's make a little camera object. Also, we can do this in a smarter way. So we're kind of, let's, let's get some more formal terms on here. Down here, this transformation is something to uh, clip space, right? We know that the value that's leaving has to be in clip space. And we say that the, the object that's coming in, hey, remember when we did the instancing and all the objects were in the same space? 
because we're only using one GPU array. Those vertices are in model space. That's that term we use there. So we say model space. And so we go from model space to world space. This is where we position it in our world, in our imaginary world that we're making up. Cool. And then we've got camera stuff. Now we're moving from the world space into, and this disagrees whether it's called camera space or whether it's called view space or whether it's called eye space or anything like this. I'm going to use view space for now and then I'll probably forget and use something different later on. And now we know that this is view space, we can say that this is view space to clip space and then wonder why I put a hyphen there because I'm inconsistent. And these are more technical terms. So what we want to do now is I want to do this world space to view space in one matrix, which is very easy to do because right now we're doing, we're doing these calculations on every single vertex, which is not many here, but it's going to get a lot as we have decent models made by people with skill. So let's go and do this a little differently. We are going to have a function that is going to make the world to view space matrix. So we'll do, call it get world to view space. And let's go and, st we've got these things down here, haven't we? We've already done some of it. So we have our camera position. So we want to take that. And we're going to want that rotation as well. So we want that. And it's the inverse position, so we're going to have to negate this. So we'll do vector three negate, negate, and a translation matrix is always a four by four. Um, three by three matrices are used for rotations most of the time. There's other things, but rotation. Four by four is used for all tra transformations, so you can have a rotation and a translation in one. Um, so if we do m four translation and I'm just going to go and look at the documentation which isn't I can look at the function signature and yeah it just takes a vector okay so it's going to take this negated vector and it's going to give it a, a, a matrix for and then we are going to instead of making a matrix three we're going to make a matrix four and we're going to combine them now the nice thing about matrices is when you multiply them together what you get is a new matrix that does both of the things. So we can upload one matrix that does the translation and the rotation in one. So that's what this is going to be. And so let's do this. Let's do world to view. And we're going to call this because it's a function. We're going to remove these two. We're going to go and we're going to go and break things for a second. Let's go find our camera position and our camera rotation. This is now going to be a matrix four. Get rid of this. We can pile it and it's going to complain that some things are no longer present. Yes, we're going to get rid of this. In fact, we'll get rid of this line because we have type less than. And we're going to do our world to view transform on our position. We'll do this and then there is no applicable method of the GLSL function multiply that takes a matrix four and a vector three, which is true. So we need to make this a vector four sooner. So let's just do it here. Position vector four, position one. We're gonna transform it with our matrix and then it's already a matrix four, so we don't need to make it one here. We multiply it with our perspective matrix. Let's get rid of that. Now it's gonna complain that down here, where we call it, we haven't recompiled this yet, so it's still trying to pass the camera position. So all we're going to do now is recompile this and say continue and everything stayed the same, which means it worked, hopefully. Or it means the, the compiler has failed and Keppel's broken and I'm going to spend the next four hours debugging things. That happened to me far too many times. Um, when are you going to transform this into hyperspace? Oh, man, this is where we need to be doing like a video just on shaders and then we can do a nice like radial blur all of a sudden. That'd be fun. Anyway. Another stream, another day. So this perspective, we already decided up here, it was the view space to clip space transform. So let's just rename this. This is view to clip. 
and we're going to break some things again. Um, indentation, that's going to complain. We're going to go up here. Perspective is now view to clip. Recompile that. It's going to complain down here because we have to go and update this. We can get rid of that and we can say continue and everything's fine. Oh, I love this language. Right. So now these are becoming more Googleable terms. So if you look up your, uh, you start Googling for world to clip transforms and uh, view space to clip space transforms, you will find articles. So we're getting less, less crappy terminology. Um, this is annoying that these are two separate variables. So let's make ourselves a camera class. And it's going to have a position and a rotation. And they should have some initial values. So let's do init form. I hate writing common list classes. The syntax is just not very pleasant to me. I, I've never really got used to it. Um, rotation, init form, identity, be an accessor because we won't be able to use it in a nice way. So it's going to be rotation and an accessor, which is position, and that's fine. Okay, so now we've got that. We will make a variable for our camera. Make instance camera. Nice, now we can get rid of these. And our function down here, our get world to view space, let's take camera as an argument. And then we can get the position of the camera and the rotation of the camera. Do that, and now it's complaining that down here, where we call it, we're not passing in a camera. So there we go. Do that, say continue. And here we are. Now, notice it's not going up and down because this bit, where is it? Set camera rotation. We're no longer using this variable. Let's get rid of that. Sanity restored. Okay, so now we have a camera. So we have camera objects. This is not the right resolution for doing this. Right, it has a position. We can set the position of the camera to be closer or further away or back at zero. We can set the rotation in the same way and everything's just going to work. Um, Shimera says, writing slots is easy if you have an editor. Okay. Do I click this link? Yes, because it's it's only on the streaming machine. What's the worst that can happen? Do you kill your own fun? Right. Um, ah. I have to look at this now. Oh, it's a little clip showing... Okay, so it's some nice syntax for... Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Do it using multiple cursors and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that works, but... Um, <laughs> not safe for work, indeed. Parens are very unsafe for that. Truth. Truth everywhere. Yeah, I still don't like it, though. I've got a little macro that make it look like structs, but I'm not going to use it in the stream because it's just going to be confusing. Um, okay, so we've got an object for our camera. Um, what we'd normally have in a game as well is we'd have classes to represent the entities in our game, little objects. So I'm not going to call it objects. What do you call things in games that's really generic? I don't know. Thing! It's a thing. And a thing also has a... Oh, we're just going to take exactly the same thing. It has a position and a rotation. Right? So we're going to make a bunch of things. Defar. Things! And we're going to loop for i below 40 and collect a whole bunch of things. We're gonna, yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, okay. And now we're gonna ditch using um, instancing and we're gonna just go for really inefficient rendering. We're just gonna render 40 times once for everything. It'll, it's like, this is a tiny example, who cares? Okay, so we're going to go down here and Loop for I oh, doing the syntax there. Thing in things. Do this for me and 
Now it looks like we have one cube again. Again, this is in model space. We're still adding on things based on that. What am I going to do here? Um, that's going to disappear. I want this to be visible just while we're hacking around because it's just more pleasant to have something on the screen. So I'm going to put it in view. Okay, so here are 40 cubes. It just looks like we've gone right back to the beginning of the stream again. Here are 40 cubes. We need to transform them. Um, the beloved loop macro. Indeed, it's ugly, but it's so good. Right. Um, and you feel free to go argue about iterate and loop. I don't care. Um, so they're all in the same space, or all in the same place rather. So let's go and move them around. So loop or yeah, thing in things do. I just don't know what syntax I'm using today. And we're going to set f the position of the thing to be. We need a random position, and. It's going to be 0, 0, minus 20. And then we're going to add some random numbers to it. So let's just do random um, 15. And then we're going to minus, oh, just do random 20 minus 10. This will spread it out between minus 10 and 10. Let's move it a little further away, 25. Um, what am I doing? Not the right thing. Here we go. That's what I wanted to copy. And apparently that should have worked. Oh, of course, we're, we're, we've set all the positions. If we go and look at our things now, where are they? Then we map over and looking at their positions, we can see they all have different positions. There we go. Positions. Right. But we need to provide a transform matrix up to the GPU. So we're going to have to do another helper function. Let's go down here. Where do we have our camera one? Get world to view space. We're going to make a get model to, what is it? Model to world space function. And we're going to make it for the thing. Let's have a quick look at chat. Um, Stops writing response about iterate. Indeed. Um, right. So, <laughs> so um, what are we going to do? Well, we basically want to do this, but without the inverting, right? We want to take our object and we want to translate it by its position and rotate it by its rotation. Uh, the camera one was just negative because we were trying to move the whole universe back to us. So we're just going to get rid of this negate. Get rid of this inverse. Oh, and we don't want to be doing that from the camera. We want to be doing it from the thing that we're trying to remember. Trying to remember, trying to position. Time for more coffee. And now we need to upload. I don't want to put it there for aesthetic reasons. Model to, because as you can see already, I'm all about aesthetics. Um, get model to world space for the thing. And then this is going to complain that we're passing an argument that it doesn't know about. We go up here and we add a new uniform, which is the model to world space matrix. We do that and say continue and everything's fine. And then finally we can come down here and we can transform our position. So we're going to multiply the position by the model to world and everything breaks. Oh yes, because we need to, need to get that position into a vector four before this will work. And then suddenly, yay, lots of things. Okay, so now we have a class for things in our game. Graphical, renderable, whatever the balls you want to call it. We have a camera that we can move around. Um, we can start animating these. We could have a function that's like update thing. Let's do that. Vivan update thing. We're probably out the po outside the point that I'm actually teaching anything at this point, and now we're just into kind of dicking around with code territory. So this is a good time to uh, shout out questions if you have them, shout out anything you want to see, except that. And um, 
we'll keep going. We're going to take the thing and we're going to update its position. What I want to do is I want them to fall downwards and then below a certain point, let's say below zero, they just come up to a certain point. They just keep falling forever. So we'll set up the Y of the position of the thing to be... This is actually going to be a place where it's actually better to use with... Uh, is it with socks? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> I know this language. Maybe. Set the Y position to be the... Oh, we can just say chromatic, can't we? Increment the Y position by something. No, actually, I will set it because I want to mod this. So set the Y to be the Y plus. And we're going to mod it by 40. And then we're going to add times 1 now. Some element of time. Okay. Oh, I'm such a muppet. We're not calling this function. Nothing's going to happen if I don't call the function. Right, update thing. Now it's breaking. There we go. That's better. At least if it's breaking, something's happening. Whoa, that's too much. Okay, let's slow this down. Holy Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm adding. I don't want to be adding, I want to be subtracting, I want them falling. There we go. And they're disappearing, and we're going to want to position our camera a bit. Position of the camera, let's set the position of the camera to be higher. Zero, ten, zero. Now we can watch them falling down and disappearing at the bottom. We might want to, say, make ourselves a little spaceship and we'll fly through here. Uh, do you, like Shamira is saying, um, why not implement a first-person camera or at least allow you to move around? The reason I'm not doing that right now is that involves um, <laughs> handling input. And my input library is a bit crap. It needs some work. And I think that might be what I do over the next week. But it's also very boring. So I've not done it yet. It's all right. Well, no, it's not. I, I, I'm, it's not acceptable because it's, it's not nice to use there and it's not documented. So it's no good. And I don't want to show that yet. <laughs> Input is easier than trial, which is Shimera's engine. Yes, it is. Well, that's good. That's nice for you. Uh, I just, <laughs> I've been so lazy. So, um, yeah, that's cool. It, it'll take it. I mean, I, it's, it's clean up. It's all there, but I just don't want to show it and say, hey, look at this stuff on the stream that I'm going to change immediately. Um, yeah, now we've got things moving and Supporting multiple cameras is a doddle, right? So we just all we're going to do is we're going to go up to where we have our camera, and we're going to make a second one. Camera one, right? And this camera can have a completely different position. All we need to do then is when we go down here when we're rendering, where's our call? We just call a different camera. And we say this is the one at zero 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 looking forward. So let's change the position of camera one. Let's put it at 10, 20, and uh, five, so nice and far away. Let's set the rotation of the camera. Be something around an axis angle again. Don't fancy doing it like that. Radians, and let's say 30. Ooh, which one have I rotated? Ah, I rotated the other one. What an idiot. Okay. Let's uh, do this and change the camera I wanted to change. There we go. So now we can go down here and we can swap out our cameras and we get two different views on our scene. So again, like, multiple cameras is kind of a misnomer again. Like... We're just, we're just taking some data from somewhere, we're making the matrices and we're pushing them up when we transform them. And having multiple cameras is just, yeah, having different sets of data. 
And then if you've seen in like in games, you'll have a TV screen or something like this. All we're gonna, all you do then is you take that second camera and you draw everything and you render it into an FBO and then you've got it in a texture, right? And then, then you can just put it on any object, texture an object with the other scene. And that's it. That's dirt simple. You could have that done in five minutes. So now it's been best part of two hours. So I think we've covered a fair bit of stuff. Was that useful? Like, um, was that, say, is, is there stuff that was super vague and you want gone over? Is there anything you'd like me to yak about? Is there anything you want to see? And I'm going to drink. Drink in a way that won't be detected by the microphone. We will see. Thank you very much. That's really nice. Thanks, Atchbiad. Cool. Hey, thanks, Shane. Right, so... Yeah, Darius, thanks. It's, um, I'm hoping I can just show some stuff. I want to escalate this naturally to get some decent graphics in here. Start showing things that are a little more interesting and we can start doing more effects and stuff like this. I, I want to play around with some... Um, like, now we've done some 3D, I can go back and we can do some terrain rendering because we've got noise and we've got basic 3D rendering, right? So now we can go generate terrains. The thing I, I actually want to do, and I'm probably going to do on one of these streams, I'll either do it on a stream like this yeah, probably, probably on one of these streams. I'm just going to do one where we just hang out and code. I'm just going to sit here and code up some stuff. And I really want to make an erosion shader. So it's going to, we're going to generate a terrain and then we're going to erode it based on some algorithm. And it's basically going to end up being, we'll take the height as a texture and we're going to modify the texture in a way that looks like erosion. I really want to do that. It'd be sick. Uh, Pom to pimp. One remark for Shimera and you, unrelated. When you post your live coding sessions, announce on our Lisp and you, um, oh yeah. When you post your live coding sessions announcement on our Lisp, you may cross post to watch people code. Yeah, I was meant to do that. And I really, I, I have been bad at that. Um, yeah, I should remember to do it. The, it's one of the ones I'm nervous about because I've had friends do this kind of stuff on Reddit bef like before. They cross-posted to programming and they're really strict. So I guess, I mean, watch people code is going to be naturally a good place to do that. But um, I'm always a bit kind of, because uh, he's just been banned from our programming, thing, like from posting in there in general for just like doing some stuff that people wanted to see. Shimera, if things don't get it to at hand, I might consider it in general. I don't post my own stuff to sites like Reddit though. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, it is, it's, it's weird. It's, it's weird kind of like pushing your stuff out there. Come watch me do things, but I don't know. There's no better way. Cool. So I think that, um, I think that about does it. Thank you so much, all of you for coming down as usual. And, uh, yeah, next week we'll do something else. Not sure what yet. Hopefully, I, like, I've been working on some physically based rendering and I thought I had it right in the weekend and then it sucked, so I need to go fix it. So I will uh, hopefully have something a little prettier for you in upcoming weeks. Take care. Thank you very much. If I can jump to the right computer, now I can stop this stream. Ciao.